My name is Siota, and I will be one of the spokespeople for all of you today. I begin today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians on the land on which we gather today. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Migraine Foundation of Australia to World Brain Day Summit, a program dedicated to improving medical awareness within the wider Australian public. The Migraine Foundation is the first migraine and brain health specific registered charity established in Australia and works to educate the public and healthcare professionals about migraines. In today's session, however, we will be discussing the importance of brain health overall, as well as methods that we can use to look after us, ourselves and care for our brains. The program brought to you today celebrates the 10th World Brain Day. For the 10th time, people from all over the world have come together to celebrate this day through local leadership from our very own Professor Tissa Wijeratna. But more on this later. There are a few housekeeping measures before we begin today's program. Please switch off your mobile phones and avoid taking photos. You are most welcome to take photos near the media wall and banners later on. The toilets are also located on the same level outside the auditorium. Don't forget to sign up for Steps for Migraine and the Migraine Foundation. We can make a difference together. Now on to the business end of the symposium. I will be your MC for the afternoon along with Dr. Melissa Tang and Dr. Daniel Barber. We hope to bring you a memorable event promoting better brain health for all of you. Now I'd like to welcome Melissa, Dr. Melissa Tang and Dr. Daniel Barber to give a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Siota, and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Barber, I'm a neurologist and movement disorder specialist. And next to me is Dr. Melissa Tang, who's also a neurologist and movement disorder specialist, just better than I am. So I'll start with just a few remarks and then we'll move on. And Siota will be the uh, master of ceremonies for, ceremonies for today. And thank you very much for being involved today. It's a pleasure to welcome you all today uh, to the Brain Health Summit for 2023. And thank you to Professor Widgeratney and the team for the opportunity to contribute to, to today's proceedings. And I'm sure I speak on Mel's part there as well. From my early intern days when I was simply shadowing neurologists, uh, Professor Widgeratney uh, and the neurology team at Western Health instilled in me the, the, the overarching principle of brain health, that individual conditions, be it stroke, dementia, mood disorders, they can't be considered in isolation. They are all simply different manifestations of the same thing, that being poor brain health. It's our strongly held belief as a team that advancements in brain health require a radical shift in our overall approach. With a groundswell of interest and advocacy required across healthcare, industry, patients, and the public at large. And this groundswell must be international and it must be collaborative. No longer can the neuroscience researcher be siloed in a lab or the clinical neurologist hidden in the four walls of their consulting rooms. We are all called to work together to, to, better, to further the goal of better brain health for all. So in the spirit of this collaborative approach, we have speakers from across the spectrum of neurology, neuroscience, physiology and occupational therapy. We extend a special welcome to those from the general public who may be with us, who share an interest in brain health and will also play a key part in our aspirations into the future. We hope that these talks are informing and interesting for you in particular. Thanks, Siona. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so I would like to now introduce our first speaker for today, who is Professor David Blacker from Western Australia. Professor David Blacker is Perrin Institute's Medical Director and Clinical Neurologist, who specialises in the diagnosis and management of a stroke. He leads the clinic alongside, nurse, uh, sorry, alongside nursing and allied health staff, 
and is pleased to assist his long-term colleague, Professor Graham Hankey, to build Stroke Centre for Excellence. Clinical Professor David Blacker received recognition as member for the Order of Australia in the King's Birthday 2023 Honours for services to medicine and neurological research. It is one thing to hear of particular conditions and situations through speeches like what we have prepared for you today, but to experience it firsthand is something completely different, which not all of us can and will truly understand. And so for that reason, we deeply thank Professor Blacker for sharing his unique journey as a person with a brain disorder while he continues to work hard to promote better brain health through education, research, and service improvement uh, locally as well as globally. Without further ado, I would now like to cordially, cordially invite Professor Blacker to share his insights. Thank you. David, you can start sharing now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Are you able to see my slides? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, very good. And congratulations to Tissa for organising what sounds like a really interesting and varied program. So that's me and my um, um, affiliations, and uh, the brain disorder that I have is Parkinson's disease, and so. Uh, with the theme of brain health today, I'm going to focus on uh, exercise, specifically exercise for Parkinson's disease, because it's been the one thing that's really uh, helped me and uh, helped me to get going. So we all know that uh, exercise has positive impacts on uh, both physical and mental health. And we should all be exercising. And uh, there are guidelines from the World Health Organization uh, for older adults suggesting that there really should be a minimum 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical exercise. For Parkinson's disease, though, it's probably true in more than a field. And in 2021, the Parkinson's Foundation of America, in combination with the American College of Sports Medicine, uh, put together this fantastic table that I met a couple of people who contributed this table last week at the World Parkinson's Conference. And uh, it stratifies various forms of exercise and it gives advice and recommendations based on the literature of the amount, number of days per week, and intensity of uh, various different forms of exercise. And I've been using this uh, with, with all Parkinson's patients, and I, I run through it with them and uh, in collaboration with their uh, physical therapists and exercise physiologists, that's really the ideal way to design a uh, personalised program. So for example, myself, I try to get the baseline 150 million 150 minutes of walking in by five, 30, five, 30 minute brisk walks per week. And uh, actually combine that with a bit of weight training, just walking with the, with the one kilogram of weights. And uh, I've been very interested in weight training over the last couple of years because there's some very good emergent data and literature on uh, the, the impact of weight training on cognitive health. But it may even turn out that weight training is better than cardiovascular training uh, for brain health. And um, it's not about being huge amounts, uh, huge weights uh, in total, it's about uh, lots of repetition and consistency. The other thing that I use is a, a hand screen device, which I might do 100 sets, uh, 100 reps, and then five or six times per day, really for four hours. Because one of the things I had been noticing is with my gradient unusia, I was getting slower, and I actually didn't think I was getting a little bit wasted in my speech. So I don't think I've that. The other thing I did is uh, three sessions a week of yoga, um, including usually at least one session of what we call yin yoga, which is a form of yoga that has a uh, uh, very uh, long, deep stretching postures, which really do help with the rigidity. We're trying to get as much golfing as I can to keep it very. What I'm going to focus on today is the, 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 my favourite bit of my exercise program, which is uh, non contact boxing. And, uh, that provides a fantastic high-intensity interval training and working. Not a lot of literature on high-intensity training, uh, high-intensity interval training uh, in, in PD at this moment, but we've started doing it. So 
we, we did a, a feasibility of instituting graduated high intensity training small feasibility study of 10 patients, which is available on open access in the PM and I gym. And uh, I'm just going to run through a little bit of background and describe what we did. But uh, you might ask, well, what does a neurologist have to do with the boxing? And I do have to emphasize this is a boxing exercise. It's not actually a sport. Boxing is no one getting hit in the head. And I became interested because my previous main form of exercise that I was golf uh, was running. And uh, in fact, I had an exercise induced dystonia in my knee that preceded the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease by about a decade. But then, as the other symptoms emerged about four or five years ago, uh, the dystonia was getting worse and worse and was making it more, more difficult to, to exercise. Also, as a busy neurologist, I was fairly time poor, and I was also finding that the amount of time required to get exercise in if you're walking uh, it was getting uh, difficult to find, and the high intensity interval training in get things done quite quickly. But the curious thing about boxing was that the, the, the stance and postures that you require to box are almost the antithesis of the postures of Parkinson's. So the uh, flexed uh, gait, the slow, weak hand movements and reduced arm speed are quite the opposite of what we have strong, stand up strong, tall, take that large or rapid movements. So it's almost the exact opposite. There's also uh, very um, good balance is required and uh, flexibility and uh, I'll tell you in the study about some of the other aspects of it there. And there's a lot of part Parkinson's people doing the boxing already and the, the Rocksteady Boxing Organisation in the US has got to a huge amount of participants. And from that, there have been a couple of observation studies, but uh, not a lot of really good high quality data. And uh, the audience in, in Victoria may be well uh, familiar with Megan Morris, an academic physiotherapist who's got a lot of interest in dance for, for Parkinson's disease. She did this uh, very good review of the for Parkinson's disease in 2019, and uh, its conclusions were that there's really a lot of unanswered questions. And perhaps people rushing into this uh, and admittedly probably having uh, um, some benefits but scientifically there wasn't much uh, recorded and so uh, it gave us a great opportunity. Now I don't have time to tell you the amazing story of how I got linked in with this, this gentleman Ray Fazio who's a former Golden Gloves champion, a, a, a fitness trainer and inventor of this device called Flight Master which is a a replacement for the big old fashioned boxing bag. This uh, has 11 indicated targets, which is designed to, to, to hit, and they're, they're quite soft, so you don't injure your hand, but they actually encourage a lot more precision. And um, here we get another famous Australian, uh, Hugh Jackman, warm up the Wolverines, uh, with Ray is training, and the tremendous lap dorsal muscles that we saw on Hugh Jackman. Work hard and do some really low repetitions on that machine. So, what, we, what I wanted to find out was could Parkinson's patients actually tolerate a very high level of training? We also wanted to just make sure, uh, and perhaps for the first time in the PD studies of exercise and boxing, just some really basic things that have been lacking from uh, the studies before, including continual heart rate monitoring. And uses the standard scales and scores that our exercise physiology colleagues typically use to measure um, uh, both physical and mental exertion. So, this is a, sort of a polar monitor. And this is, in fact, one of my own sessions here. On the uh, left hand side, you'll see my actual heart rate. On the right hand side, uh, you'll see the heart rate expressed as a percentage of heart rate the maximum for a uh, high intensity. It's, to be regarded as more than 80% of the heart rate maximum that is regarded as high intensity training. And as you can see, this one hour session started out in less than 84, and it's a gradual warm up, stretching, and flexibility. And then at the 30 minute mark, we started to do some aerobic work, including star jumps and twist jumps and lunges, so it's a pretty hard aerobic stuff there. And then in the latter half, from about 
about 40 minutes on, you'll see this sort of pattern go up and down, up and down, up and down, managing into the A and Z zone. And uh, that's been doing the rounds of boxing. So about two and a half minutes of very different sequences on that machine, those different numbers. You'll be doing uh, maybe five or six punches and then moving around and then detaching from the other side. And so there's a whole sequence sequence that we went through. We also had exercise physiology students involved and uh, they were really continually asking our subjects uh, these questions uh, for the uh, um, rating scales. We kept a very close track on the development of any injuries. And um, in fact, a lot of this started uh, with the previous World Parkinson's Day and World Brain Day talks that I did a couple of years ago. And uh, the way that we uh, garnered our subjects was uh, pretty much uh, they all phoned into the parent institute and put them on a big list, and then uh, we systematically just them on top of the bottom of the list. And uh, we got 10 subjects. Uh, uh, mean age of 60, their uh, baseline uh, motor and video scales there. Uh, most of them pretty early onset in the disease, less than five years. And uh, I won't go through all the details. But uh, one of the features of the workout I mentioned before is the, uh, um, the postures that are very big antithesis of Parkinson's disease. And one of the first things I saw Ray do was he chose some workout the warm up, which involves simply straightening out the arm. <laughs> the very action of that is the opposite of the fist. Um, so that really is a, a good start. And so we've taken through a lot of the uh, movement. You see the box is doing these little movements back and forth, back and forth, so you don't get hit in the nose. And it turns out that it's really helpful for uh, engaging the core and improving your balance. And uh, hopefully that will convert to reducing the falls risk because as you know, Parkinson's disease, fall on breaking the hip and then it's precipitant for the, the downward spiral. So we ran through the, uh, all these different sequences on the boxing machine and uh, we put together a training schedule with the, um, three different blocks. And uh, one of the great things we had was, was working with exercise physiologists. Now they are expert at redesigning training programs and incorporating various different levels of load, including physical and cognitive loads. And uh, so we split this into three portions. Um, the first month, and we're really focusing on building up their physical fitness and teaching them the techniques of boxing. We gave them a little rest. And then we got into this middle section, which is called boxes cardio. And I almost likened this to a phase one uh, clinical drug trial where you put in the dose up higher and higher and higher and see how far you can go and uh, before toxicity occurs. And um, I was expecting that we had to ease off, but amazingly, uh, these subjects all got through it fantastically. And uh, so by the end of it, uh, you've got Parkinson's patients average over 60 doing three uh, one-hour sessions per week, and within those one-hour sessions, at least 30, cuts in 40 minutes at a very high intensive load. Then in the final um, block of training, we eased off the, uh, the physical uh, stress and we actually got through some more cognitive type challenges. And what I mean by that is that whilst they were exercising, we were, we were mixing it up with our instructions. So for example, we trained to do uh, sequences in the orthodox right-hand stance, then we could flip around and do it in the south pool stance, making mirror images of the, the, the sequence, which is surprisingly hard to do. We also get them to do uh, uh, we would call out sequence of numbers of their pads to hit anywhere up to seven to nine digits, and then they'd have to hit those digits. So they had uh, the short term memory at the same time as physically exerting themselves. So a very good example of dual tasking. So this is all uh, during the COVID era, so it was a little bit difficult. But what uh, I was very impressed that uh, we only lost four sessions due to injury, and these are just minor injuries that were uh, able to recover. And um, the, uh, the conclusion really was that we could do this safely. 
we had a, a whole lot of uh, data that we still uh, probably going to analyze and work through a little bit more. But just to illustrate, on the bottom panel, we've got uh, the number of workouts, and each workout component is about five minutes, so we talk to us for an hour. And uh, the, the dotted line in the middle is the uh, percentage heart rate maximum. And you'll see the various different blocks. They're really getting up to high intensities uh, um, for all the sessions. We have uh, a very small sample, of course, they come up to our conclusions. Um, there are fatigue scars that we did a baseline and follow. And interestingly, uh, 8 out of 10 patients had a decrease in fatigue during the program. And this is a pretty arduous program. There's lots of exercise that was done at the University of Southern Peter's Town in the northern suburbs, which in some patients it's an hour's drive to traffic in the peak hour. So it was a big, big commitment. Um, there was no significant problem with pain and uh, sleep. Uh, quality was actually increased. Uh, we did a new DRS pre and post, un unblinded, so you can't really make too much of a conclusion. But, uh, no, the, the blue bars are the pre and the mauve bars are the post, and uh, everyone except one patient had uh, improvements, so uh, um, an exploratory kind of. So, in conclusion, this is the first boxing based study uh, that I could find uh, for Parkinson's with any heart rate data or validated measures, and I, I know that there are a couple of other studies coming out featuring high intensity training including one from Canada and she's cycling and um, the, uh, the next steps that we'd like to do is try and make this uh, program available and uh, Ray and I are currently working on a series of instructional videos. Uh, eight out of the ten participants uh, after the study concluded, um, plus myself and a couple of other new people, for about a year we did a Tuesday evening session uh, where we were all just zooming and um, have a uh, get together and uh, I've got a machine on my front porch and people put them in the garages and uh, um, <coughs> these machines can be purchased at this uh, website address. There, there are many questions that we can still look at. Um, I'm particularly interested in perhaps doing some controlled studies comparing it with other exercise forms. So, uh, as I said at the start, boxing is a highly uh, effective way of getting your heart rate up and getting a lot of exercise done quickly and it might equate with the amount of cardiovascular exercise that you do and with 30 minutes of boxing is probably equivalent to uh, maybe yeah, 60 minutes of cycling um, or even an hour and a half of walking. So we can combine, uh, compare, say, cycling versus boxing and uh, the, the boxing, I would argue, potentially has a more specific uh, impact on things like balance and uh, dexterity. So I've probably got a little bit over time, but uh, there's um, so much that can be done with, with exercise, and uh, I can personally vouch for the fact that uh, every time I do a high-intensity training exercise, I get uh, maybe a couple of hours of uh, feeling up that we're almost to get by, I've got I can move more freely and uh, uh, hope that uh, this will be one of the ways that we can uh, modify the disease. So, happy brain day and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. So David, thank you so much for that very inspiring talk. And it's a good example of how I always talk to the people that I diagnose with Parkinson's disease and let, not letting the condition define them. You've taken over, you've created this program, you've, you know, you've been empowered not only for yourself through exercise and um, being able to track progress, which is something I find very motivating for my own personal exercise journey. The question I have really stems from the fact that people with Parkinson's disease often experience apathy. In your study, uh, are non-motor symptoms explored, and how do you encourage people with apathy to exercise? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's always the, the, the trouble, and 
and um, there, there is data from normal populations about how long it takes to, 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 to develop a, uh, turn a new task into a habit. And it probably is about six weeks. And um, so in the exercise world, it probably takes about six weeks for someone to go from a walker into a jogger into a bar. And uh, the, uh, I think the apathy uh, itself, the knowledge is probably should be people making sure that there's uh, um, some baseline support in the SSRI or perhaps even the Mayo B inhibitor to submit them. Uh, I know the Sathinamide team are, are very interested in that. Um, and I'm personally on Sathinamide, and I think that probably will build me up. Uh, but I think uh, by in, in encouraging that uh, sense of uh, uh, independence, really, and uh, the fact that you can get through that physical phase, uh, that will kick you off. And uh, all the patients that were in our study will continue to. to um, uh, just about the part of the exercise. So I think you're right. That apathy is a, diff a difficult thing, but uh, if we encourage them to, to just push on for a month or so, um, then they'll get through. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's an evolution, isn't it, from habit to dis or from discipline and into making something a habit. Um, does anyone else in the audience have a question? Well, Tiss has got a question. I'll figure out the thing. Worst case scenario, I'll relay it. David, Hang on. David. Oh, can you hear that? Oh, there we go. Go ahead. My, my question is, uh, the as you know, two of the holy grail for Parkinson's disease for us is uh, early diagnosis and disease-modifying therapy. I get the feeling, having seen how you're flying since you start exercise program, uh, there seems to be a potential for neuroprotection from exercise. Uh, uh, do you believe in this uh, theory or the, any, any comments? Uh, do you believe that uh, exercise could potentially uh, bring uh, uh, some sort of a neuroprotection uh, in, in Parkinson's disease? Um, 
she, not everyone has the able to high intensity levels of exercise uh, as the disease progresses um, and due to musculoskeletal issues or problems or pain. And it's just those group of patients who might benefit from this idea of uh, isolating factors that are uh, available from exercise, refining, and then you have them a natural neuroprotective but uh, uh, chemical, really. So we, we might actually be missing the whole thing uh, by looking at the drugs. We might be needing to look into ourselves and do our own metabolism. Yeah, that's where the answer may be. A slightly different question, uh, David. Obviously, you can't play music when you are playing golf, uh, but do you add music uh, when you do vigorous exercise for half an hour, some metal music or any other personal favorite music uh, to keep you going? Yeah, well, in the study, um, it was interesting. Early in the study, we had a, a section of the gymnasium which was pretty close to where the university students were doing their exam, so we had to be pretty quiet. But when the term was over, there were no students around. Uh, the generation of the, the participants was sort of the uh, 80s rock, really. And um, <laughs> you can see the, all these uh, boxing people going with some ACDC uh, getting pumped out. It was a fantastic experience. And uh, I think it certainly helps to get through uh, the hard sessions. And uh, mm -hmm. we had a, well, one of the participants was a, a Scotsman, and he. Uh, was really rocking out his boxing to the ACBCT bagpot music. <laughs> And I think, I think that's a very good point. Motivation is enhanced through music, um, through competition, through the peer group that we get with the boxing programs, because it's a group. Uh, it's a group program, isn't it, David? Your, your boxing? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Next, we did exit interviews, and the camaraderie really was a huge comment. Well, we almost all um, uh, commented. And, uh, I've seen that in other studies around the place where that group session we all sort of and that's the other thing for, for apathy as well you know if, if you know that you've committed um, and people are expecting you to show up uh, that also uh, makes you makes you go there rather than giving up yeah the obliger uh, the, the obligers and all of us are worried about letting down other people and yeah. so that commitment um, do you have any questions Dan? No, just to thank you very much, David, for your time today. It was very interesting to hear. Oh, sorry, we have... So is there one more? Sorry. I just wanted to get... I know that there's a young scientist or budding scientist in the audience who is working in music and brain health. Uh, not sure whether he is around to make a comment. Uh, Whilst we're waiting... Uh, in, in, introduce yourself and then uh, the, the, the say a few things. Thank you. Um, uh, hello, David. My name is Nuan. I... Uh, do a lot of research into vibration. I was wondering if you have investigated the impact of uh, standing on vibration plates in Parkinson's. Have you um, looked at vibration plates? I think they were pioneered by the Russians in the space program to um, attenuate muscle loss during space flight. Um, I'm wondering if some aspect of the uh, like low frequency vibration could have a benefit to Parkinson's. Well, well in fact, the, the observation, Sh Sharp made the observation that some of his patients he saw in, in, in France who were coming on the, uh, arriving in carriages of the cobblestones and getting vibrated by, by ear. And uh, he uh, made that observation all those years ago that maybe um, that was somehow impacting upon the, the tremor of attenuating and as you might have seen, uh, there's uh, some gloves that have been marketed uh, with, uh, with vibration pulses. Um, but I don't know. Uh, at a central level, we know that there are circuits that get enhanced, um, circuits that get inhibited, and perhaps uh, if there's a sensory um, level of a certain harmonic, um, in the same way that our deep brain simulation patients are now getting analysis of their uh, patterns, um, there, there might be really something in it. So if you have a sensory input that matches a certain harmonic um, in your central circuitry, uh, perhaps that will make a difference. 
Interesting. A lot of my research uh, is around uh, like vowel toning, kind of like omming, um, like vocal vocal vibration. Um, do you have any advice on how I could create a protocol for investigating the effects of vocal vibration or humming on Parkinson's symptoms? Well, I think that's the, the yoga thing is um, the, uh, that, that controlled breathing and the uh, group session that makes it, if you can get in a yoga class and you have a beautiful own at the end with controlled breath, um, you can feel it vibrating through the whole class. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you very much. It would be remiss of me not to add in a plug for our Victorian um, PCYC uh, boxing program here in St Kilda. Um, so it's a great program, lots of the people that I work with are attendees and it was recently featured in our Channel 7 News. Does anyone else have any questions for David or? Otherwise, thank you so much. It was so inspiring. It's always inspiring to hear you talk anyway. And to read about your journey. Thank you, Professor Blacker. And it's great to see some involvement from the crowd as well with questions. So throughout today's program, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask and share your insights too. Um, now I take the pleasure in introducing our second speaker, who is Professor Tissa Wijeratna. Professor Wijeratna is a senior neurologist, professor in neurology, director, an academic in medicine, and the head of the Department of Neurology and Stroke at Western Health. While holding a number of leaderships locally and globally, he is a proficient publisher and an accomplished international speaker with his translational research in clinical neurology. This has generated more than 300 publications, 148 invited presentations, and more than 98,000 citations. Wow, that is a lot of numbers. Professor Wijay Ratna masterminded the birth of the Australian and New Zealand Headache Society in 2014 in collaboration with four of his colleagues. He is also the founder of the Migraine Foundation and the co-founder of the Australian Institute of Migraine. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Tissa Wijay Ratna. Up. Just bear with me until uh,
kind of a sad uh, it uh, then uh, the slowly fade down after today and uh, in in the coming days uh, and while it's being uh, many sleepless nights uh, and busy days uh, kind of a becoming less busy in that context uh, make you sad uh, somewhat obviously this audience uh, whether face to face or virtually or uh, the web space uh, doesn't probably need to remind that uh, the brain is the most uh, amazing organ in our body it basically define who we are what we do we feel we read we aim we dream we achieve we enjoy thanks to this amazing organ obviously most of us uh, talk too much uh, there's reason behind that as you can see from the image uh, our brain has allocated significant space uh, for our mouth uh, and hand i also put uh, some of the other important uh, things into this picture also uh, i am uh, hugely interested uh, in human eye uh, that is because uh, vision drives uh, our behavior 90% of the time compared to rest of the other sense organs uh, there's a lot of work uh, happening at the moment to uh, extract a uh, whole lot of biomarkers uh, of eye re- in relation to brain health uh, i can see a couple of my partners in crime in this audience uh, and a uh, couple of a couple of our partners in crime uh, in global audience uh, also so we hope uh, within the next 5 uh, to 10 years uh, we would give you whole lot of uh, fancy but cheap easily available toolkits to deal with uh, fellow human beings with brain problems to sort them out uh, easier i also put a picture of uh, the uh, peripheral nerves uh, which are the biological electrical wires that get your arms and legs uh, and other organs uh, moving uh, i did not add uh, autonomic nervous system to this uh, if not for my autonomic nervous system i wouldn't be able to stand uh, here and talk to you so these are all things uh, that are evolving as we speak uh, the fellow researchers are trying their best to bring them to the bedside so that we can promote quality brain health and better neurology worldwide so at this point of time if i were to put uh, uh, all cancer related problems uh, and all cardiovascular disorders to one side and calculate the cost of uh, dealing with them that entire cost is uh, much less than the cost that this world pay to deal with uh, just three simple brain conditions anxiety depression and headache disorders this is not even taking to some of the big uh, members uh, in brain disorders such as uh, stroke uh, dementia etc so the brain conditions cost this world a lot the reason that uh, we were agitated not to have a brain day and not to raise awareness of brain health uh, is uh, we put very little attention to brain that's why this world in this place uh, Uh, and uh, the this is why we should celebrate world brain day not only uh, regarding re- remembering that uh, brain conditions cost us a lot uh, and brain conditions affect us uh, a lot whether we like it or not in fact the latest uh, evidence suggests that one in two of us are having a brain disorder whether we like it or not you heard from david one of the esteemed uh, uh, stroke uh, the 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 clinician scientist that australia has donated to the world uh, he is uh, suffering from parkinson's disease as we speak uh, uh, myself uh, melissa tang and daniel barber all three of us could well be suffering from parkinson's disease without us having a clue at this point of time because uh, the clinical signs of these disorders manifest uh, 10 20 30 years later any one of us in this audience could well be suffering from alzheimer's disease or some other neurodegenerative disorder without uh, us being aware of that uh, at this point of time so 
at least for the selfish reason that if one in two of us are having a brain disorder, we must be interested in brain health and promoting brain health. Just to give you some of the numbers, uh, at this point of time, there are over 111 million stroke survivors living in the world. There are well over 2 billion people living with either tension type headache or migraine type headaches. Well over 50 million people living with the impact of cognitive impairment, dementia. And there are over 3 million cases of multiple sclerosis. The COVID-19, I read a recent paper published in Brazil saying that one in four of us who got COVID-19, knowingly or unknowingly, does have impaired brain, hand, eye coordination deficits. I cannot stop the, the think that the reason that Victoria is having the highest road death toll four or five times higher than usual years at this point of the year could potentially be due to this. The reason that we see outrageous drivers in our highways at times could potentially be due to this. But we have not studied this despite we live in one of the first worlds in the, in the world. So obviously the, the impact of brain disorders are huge. But on a positive note, you would be surprised to hear that uh, nearly 90% of the strokes uh, could have been prevented uh, if we live well uh, using the, the wellness concepts uh, and healthy lifestyle. About 40% uh, of the dementia out of that 50 million people could not have occurred uh, if we apply basic uh, preventative uh, measures. Unfortunately, you won't see a preventative brain health unit anywhere in the world at this point of time, which is what we need. We don't need to build uh, nations uh, suffering from a whole lot of disability. We needed to look at ways to reduce that disability. Raising awareness and education is the key to deal with them. The best example of uh, how much education can fly is me. I was born in a fairly rural Sri Lankan city and I'm the first one to get into a university from my village. That led to a mass exodus of a whole lot of kids developing towards university education from that village and entire the, the, the school bus route. And as you can see, once you educate one kid, the impact of that not only uh, the, 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 the go on to help that village, that city, that country, different nations, uh, and eventually the world. So education is the key to most of these uh, solutions. So here on this slide, uh, I have put uh, two things. Apologies uh, for the language that some of you would not recognize. Uh, this is uh, written in Sinhalese language on your right hand side. Uh, it's a quote from a uh, really clever, wise uh, humankind uh, who was born uh, uh, the, close to the border of Nepal. There was no Nepal or India at that time. This is, I'm talking about uh, almost 3,000 years back. Uh, this is uh, Lord Buddha's uh, st statement. Uh, he, the, I quote, he says, uh, the, the health uh, is the biggest uh, benefit or biggest wealth uh, that uh, one could ever achieve for. We all realize that uh, the, the wealth uh, take you nowhere if there is a strict lockdown or if, if there is a pandemic uh, during the early stages of pandemic. Uh, that was 3,000 years ago, almost 3,000 3, years ago. On the opposite side uh, with uh, uh, the red uh, lines, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all detail. This is the definition of health from World Health Organization uh, that uh, came out uh, in late 1980s uh, when I was still a high school student. Uh, World Health Organization at that time defined health as uh, not just absence of disease, but complete uh, well-being, social, psychological, and physical. Although 
we did not have a concept of brain health or World Brain Day 3,000 years ago or when I was a high school student, you could see that humankind recognized the importance of brain and brain health for a long, long, long period of time. So we didn't really discover anything new. We just rehash and package it using the technology and other things and reaching out to many more humankind so that we can live a better world when we leave this planet. Fortunately, with a lot of hard work over the last 20 years or so, now we have an official definition of brain health from World Health Organization. World Health Organization says that brain health as the state of brain functioning across a whole lot of domains, cognitive, sensory, social, emotional, behavioral, and motor, as you heard from our previous speaker. So the idea is uh, brain health is important uh, for a person to realize their full potential uh, over the life course, uh, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, early childhood, teenage years, uh, young age, middle age, and as we grow older, whether we suffer from a brain disorder or not. So there is, uh, uh, I would recommend you to read uh, the, the WHO position white paper that you can download freely from Google. It's a worthwhile read. Uh, and if you haven't read that sort of a thing, that's a good brain health exercise also. When you read things that you don't like to read, uh, it improves your brain health. Uh, So the key points uh, that I'm, I'm, I have been trying to drive home so far is uh, uh, the, I already mentioned to you the importance of uh, prevention. I already mentioned to you about the importance of uh, awareness. Uh, I will spend a minute or two the talking about uh, access to care. I was in Sri Lanka a couple of days back. Uh, the, my mum uh, is uh, suffering from cognitive impairment uh, and uh, I was desperate to take her out and stimulate her brain as best as possible while we were also training the entire Sri Lankan Allied Health Force on rehabilitating Parkinson's disease people on a one-day workshop. And the, 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 it is important for people like my mum to not to look at them as a cost or burden uh, although, although we use this terminology to drive home message, message, messages. Uh, for me, she is the superhero who made me uh, who I am today, despite she had no idea that uh, I could end up in medical school. The days that she pushed me on cold days from that mountain top, forcing me to study, and every time when I was wanting to take a wrong turn, wrong turn, uh, the punishing me and then driving me back to the right path, uh, uh, how could I ever look at her as a burden or cost? Every patient that we see is somebody's mum, somebody's dad, somebody's husband, somebody's wife, somebody's child. They are not just uh, the, 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 the numbers or costs or burdens. So the access to these people, to the the best possible resources uh, that we have in that region, that nation, is, is, is a highest priority. Uh, I could see that uh, three days ago, when we were trying to get my mum to the van that we were traveling in, both my dad and me and my wife had to support her. But with her stubborn sons, uh, the push uh, and prodding uh, the as I was leaving Colombo yesterday, uh, the, as she was uh, coming out along the, the, the hotel corridor in Nigambu that we were living in, she was walking independently. This is not being accessed by any physio or trained allied health person. I'm just a straightforward, simple neurologist who kept pushing her and the, not yelling, but uh, constantly encouraging her to try and the, find her independence as best as I can. So universal access to care, treatment, rehabilitation, and assistive technology as we continue to expand uh, the, the, the care is needed uh, worldwide. 
Australia has a long way to go. We have this uh, silly way of uh, allocating funding. Uh, the, the resources are allocated uh, on the basis of uh, the suburb that you live in or the, the, the hospital network that you are part of. Uh, the, while uh, the, I am supportive for any funding to anybody, it is important uh, that uh, we, we bring care and access uh, universal irrespective of uh, the, the, uh, the suburb that you live in or, or the region that you live in. Uh, and Australia can take a lead role in this regard uh, as uh, the this is uh, the equity problem is a big problem in the in the developed world you would be surprised to hear that US uh, uh, the the where most of us uh, senior neurologists probably pay anything from $10,000 to $20,000 per year to maintain our continuous medical education because they produce uh, some of the best journals and publications uh, this super rich country, if you are a 15 year old boy, your chance of surviving to 60 years of age is worse than 60 other countries in the world. Surprising to hear, isn't it? This is because of this lack of equity and the, the, the issues with resource allocation and issues with access to care, uh, treatment, rehabilitation and assistive technology, which is uh, uh, which needs a lot of attention. Same goes true for UK and most other developed countries also. So we need to address these issues in resource limited setting and we need to address these issues in the developed world also. So I have a famous quote that even if you train all medical students in all medical schools in the world to become neurologists, you cannot still solve these problems in an easy way. Obviously, I already mentioned to you the power of education, and the power of advocacy is uh, also the, 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 the quite unbelievable. You already heard a casual conversation between a relatively young neurologist and an established neurologist 14, 15 years back, led to the generation of a concept co called World Brain Day, that then led to a massive uh, advocacy campaign where we are almost in the process of making brain health a household name globally. And uh, the, the, it is important uh, that when we advocate, uh, we advocate uh, not, on, not, not to gain things for ourselves, uh, but advocate uh, for the benefit of uh, or the greater good of a uh, greater number of uh, people. I would also like to spend a minute or two on disability. Uh, let's uh, ask, ask a question. Uh, Dr. Daniel Barber, uh, the, you are probably familiar with uh, Dr. Foster Kennedy, isn't it? Uh, uh, you're familiar with Foster Kennedy? Uh, a little, yes. Yes, uh, Foster Kennedy syndrome, uh, the, the one side optic atrophy, one side papilledema. Robert Foster Kennedy uh, was an esteemed neurologist uh, originally from Ireland, uh, later on moved to USA. Uh, if you Google him, if you look at his uh, Wiki page, you could see the contributions that he made. But there's a very dark side to uh, the, this gentleman also. Let me take you back to 1941, eugenic era. Uh, the, the Foster Kennedy was uh, one of the strong advocates uh, who was working with uh, his counterparts in Germany at that time, who openly writing editorials and publishing papers and giving talks, uh, saying that uh, in the name of God, uh, we should get rid of uh, people with uh, disability as they were inferior to live with uh, the people with uh, ability. The reason that I'm reminding you of this dark era, I don't have any anger or unhappiness against this gentleman. When I read out that statement, the emotion that I had in my mind was just like two plus two equal four. The, the, the reason for that is uh, that's where we come from, but we come a long way now. Disability uh, is a human right now. I told you that I was in Sri Lanka. I was in Sri Lanka with a larger part of other the, the, the consortium also from Canada and US uh, doing a whole lot of charity work. 
rest of the other members of the family are still continuing with that work uh, uh, as I flew back to Melbourne uh, this morning. The, this is because uh, countries like uh, the, the, the low to middle uh, income countries, uh, disability is still uh, regarded as charity or disability is still regarded as uh, people who are able to afford uh, donating things. Uh, we do need to address this issue and continue to refine and define what disability is and make that a human right worldwide. So World Federation Neurology this year, uh, my president is in China at the moment uh, and the Secretary General is uh, uh, the, in a different part of the world and I am here and we are all regrouping, regrouping tonight uh, the, the, to, to drive home these messages worldwide. And also, uh, don't forget uh, that uh, the, 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 the disability is going to affect us, in fact, all of us, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, I have already done my fair share of uh, transient disability with uh, significant illnesses in the past, uh, and I'm sure there's more to come in time to come also. Some of us uh, would end up with permanent disability, some of us with transient disability, but every one of you in this audience uh, and uh, all of all your loved ones are going to taste disability also. That's why we need to be interested in all these things. But the positive note that I wanted to add is education, awareness, uh, early treatment uh, and interventions uh, can reduce uh, disability significantly. As you uh, the witness uh, from Professor David Blacker's talk, uh, you could throw any academic question at him and he would uh, revert back with uh, the most outstanding answer despite the underlying neurological disorder. So when you manage uh, disorders well, you can mitigate uh, disability significantly. I think I talked a lot uh, on all these themes. Uh, the, I got a lot of slides uh, to go through, but uh, in the interest of time, and uh, there are other speeches that you hear, what I wanted uh, you to concentrate on is uh, how we can uh, the use days like World Brain Day and contents that we create on World Brain Day to promote uh, quality brain health and quality neurology worldwide. Uh, and, uh, we have done a lot of work, a uh, lot of work uh, still need to be done. And uh, the education and awareness uh, is critically important uh, when we try and prevent uh, these disorders uh, and uh, provide uh, quality access to care. And uh, getting rid of uh, terminologies uh, such as uh, cost, burden, and making brain health uh, a humanistic uh, approach or a human thing need a lot of work. And I'm inviting you all to rally around those tasks and see what we can do to bring humanity back to brain health uh, and eventually when our time comes to leave this planet, uh, hopefully we can leave a much better planet uh, than where we began. And uh, this uh, the, the involved uh, not only taking care of us, uh, but taking care of our environment also. And with that, I'll stop here, and I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, now or later on. Please don't forget uh, to the, the pick up your phone and uh, the go to World Federation Neurology website, uh, and our global webinar still has a few hundred uh, tickets available. It's free entry. Last time when I checked, uh, 657 people registered uh, for the webinar tonight, uh, and it will be a really moving story. We got uh, uh, the little bit of a teaser. We got uh, the two patients uh, from uh, Africa sharing their story with uh, their brain condition. Uh, really uh, moving story from uh, Sri Lankan, uh, the, the physician with a brain condition, uh, incurable brain condition, uh, uh, sharing her story, followed by a couple of us uh, the, uh, trying to share our messages uh, on how we should uh, promote brain health and reduce disability globally from 
north to south, uh, west to east, uh, black, white or different color without having any boundaries or borders. Uh, so you could still pick up a ticket. Uh, so the, the, the way to do that is uh, go to World Federation Neurology website. If you just uh, Google World Brain Day 2023 webinar registration, that would directly take you there. We are normally visited by a few million people on a daily basis uh, and I would strongly encourage uh, Australian colleagues to do that. Uh, Australia has a long way to go to, to promote uh, quality neurology and better brain health for everyone despite the firepower that we have uh, in big cities uh, uh, in, in this nation. So thank you for coming and thank you for listening and thank you for the web audience also. like to welcome our next speaker for today, who is a familiar face to all of us, Dr. Daniel Barber. He's a neurologist from Melbourne and having completed his advanced training at Eastern and Western Hospitals, Dr. Barber also completed a fellowship in movement disorders at the Austin Hospital under the teachings of Dr. Andrew Hughes. Daniel obtained a prior honours degree in neuroscience at the University of Toronto also. He has a particular interest in movement disorders and neurodegenerative disorders, which he will be discussing with us today. Dr. Daniel Vava, the lecture is all yours. Thanks, guys. Conscious of time, so brevity is key for me. inspiring and, and, and sweeping uh, discussion about neurology and, and brain health in general. But my remit is about neurodegenerative disorders. Um, even that word is hard to get out. And uh, my intention is to be quick and to talk about it from a public health point of view, because there's been a lot of uh, talk in the media recently about um, uh, a drug, a, a, a biologic a monoclonal antibody that's showing some degree of promise and at the very least slowing the progression of Alzheimer's dementia. And so there is a lot of groundswell in the, the broader public about what could be coming in terms of management of dementia. So brain health and disease, here's something that's pretty obvious. The brain is prone to dysfunction and it's prone to decay. And the reason for that, whoops, let's come back here. The reason for that is the brain is incredibly complex and it's prone to the forces of entropy. Entropy being movement from order to chaos. Um, so how quickly does it take my two-year-old to trash his room as opposed to clean it up? Well, he doesn't clean it up, but the, obviously everything is moving towards disorder. And it's a bit bracing looking at my seven-week-old child and looking at that child and thinking, in terms of a lifetime incidence, He's about a one in three chance of having a, a diagnosable anxiety disorder in his lifetime and almost one in two chance of having some form of a mental illness that's diagnosable. More than one in ten chance of developing some form of substance dependency. He has a one in four lifetime chance of having a symptomatic stroke. About a 4% risk of having symptomatic Parkinson's disease and that's probably a, a pretty significant underestimate. And, and Alzheimer's dementia, one in 10, because he's a boy, but it would be one in five if I had a little girl. So in some respects, as, the, as, as things stand right now, uh, brain disorders is, is, is a part of the normal human experience, which speaks to the fact that uh, brain disability, it needs to be respected, both in terms of those who suffer them, but they also need to be respected in terms of the enormous toll, the enormous suffering that places on the community at large. And I, by that I mean the global community, because they were global statistics. 
And let's talk about long COVID, for example. Long COVID, there's been a lot in the media about long COVID and a lot in the community. As a neurologist, I'm sure uh, Tissa and Mel would, 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 would also agree. We're starting to see young people, um, quite young people, trickling through our doors with these unexplained symptoms that, are va- that appear to be vaguely neurological. Um, interruptions to sleep patterns, uh, difficulty with concentration, memory, headaches, migraines, fatigue, exercise intolerance, all things we often see with chronic traumatic encephalopathy or um, severe concussion syndromes. And it's got this sort of overarching description of long COVID. We think these are the prolonged effects of people who have had coronavirus infections. And it seems to be not in any way related to how severe their sick illness was in the uh, initial phase. And it's not limited just to the neurological system. So it's got this term long COVID, but the reality is, there's probably nothing unique about it. There were always clues that inflammation from viral infections could trigger brain ill health. We had chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, which um, we recognise can be triggered by viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus um, or VZV, for example, or other, other acute viral illnesses. There was always a clue that inflammation affected brain function. If we turn on my the Parkinson's disease, an area of particular interest for me, we talk about the Parkinson's pandemic. So we just went through the COVID pandemic. Pandemic's a bit of an extreme term because it's going to come at us slower, but the numbers are going to be just as serious. And we expect the, the world incidence of PD to double by 2030 and triple by 2050. What are our risk factors? Is it genetic? Everyone with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease wants to know if they got it from their mum or dad because maybe they had a grandparent that might have had Parkinson's disease. But what they mean is, did I get it from a single gene? Am I going to give it to my children? And that's quite rare. But clearly there's a broad genetic spectrum that confers some degree of risk. But there must be environmental triggers. We see cluster effects globally. To a certain extent, any random phenomenon can cluster as well. But we have, we have enough data to suggest that, for example, exposure to uh, organic compounds, organophosphates, probably can drive Parkinson's disease, if not entirely, then earlier in those who are prone, some heavy metals as well. And what role does inflammation play in all of this, this intersect between genetics and environmental factors? Well, just to be very quick here, this is the protein that is Parkinson's disease. Notice I didn't say it caused it. I don't have any evidence, I, don't, I can't prove that. But when I say it is Parkinson's disease, is that this is the only absolute diagnostic tool. To, if you want to know if someone has Parkinson's disease or not, you have to demonstrate that this particular protein called alpha-synuclein has accumulated in clumps in the brain in these particular parts. That's technically the only way you can prove without doubt that someone has Parkinson's disease and it clumps in these things called Lewy bodies. But what's amazing about this protein is that we find it right through the body. And we think that probably it starts in the skin. And the, and the disease of Parkinson's disease might not start in the nervous system. It might be the skin. It could be the nose. It could be the gut. And that's less of a stretch when you think about the the origin of these cells. The nervous system, you have to think back to your embryology if you, if you did some. The skin cells and the nervous system have a common origin, the ectoderm. The melanin in your skin that determines, I don't have any because of my Irish background, but if you have melanin in your skin, that molecule manufactured by your melanocytes is basically dopamine. Just a couple of modifications to the molecule and you've got dopamine, the molecule that is, requ- that, uh, is deficient to cause the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So, what does this mean in terms of early diagnosis? Can we catch these people before they get the disease? Because by the time someone comes into my office with a tremor and a little bit of stiffness on one side of the body and they're still wondering whether or not they're just a little bit anxious, I can tell them that their brain has been degenerating probably for at least 10 to 15 years silently. And so if we're gonna modify the disease in any really meaningful way, we've gotta pick up these people earlier. So can we look at their skin? Could we take a biopsy somewhere? And this could be the way into doing this. Synuclein is what's called a prion. Some of us might be familiar with prions with Kreuzfeldt-Jakob or mad cow disease. Don't panic, PD doesn't behave like mad cow disease. But that protein 
behaves like a prion, or another way to describe it is the bad apple in the bunch. Much like when you throw a rotten apple into a cart, it makes the other apples rot away quicker. Misfolded alpha-synuclein, that protein in Parkinson's disease, appears to be able to trigger a chain reaction, just like the apple in the, in the, in the cart, aka it acts like a prion. That's what a prion is. And we can utilise that phenomenon to look for it in tissues. So what we want to know is, can we take it out of skin? Can we take it out of uh, nasal epithelium or out of a gut biopsy? Could I take it out of sweat or a hair sample? and prove that you're starting to accumulate this protein. We take a bit of the tissue, we put it on a plate, and we bash it really, really fast to the point that the human eye can't even see it. And it induces other proteins around it to misfold as well and form into clumps just like we think it does in your body. And if it does that, it creates this signal that we can see. And it can prove that you're already starting to accumulate the protein in your skin that is one day going to arrive in your brainstem and give you Parkinson's disease. But is it as simple as removing that protein? If we find it 10 to 15 years before you develop a tremor, do I just have to go away and try and get rid of the protein somehow? Maybe, but all we know is that it's associated with Parkinson's. I, I, we don't know that it causes it. It could be the result of some other process within your cells. And this is just the product, much like the soot on the ground after a fire. The soot didn't cause the fire, it's there because of it. And alpha synuclein is a protein in the middle, and you can see this complex interaction with all this other stuff, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. It, 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 is a, it is an absolute miasma of different pathways. But are there clues from other diseases? And this is my last point. Alzheimer's dementia is even more common than Parkinson's, and lo and behold, just like Parkinson's, it has a protein that behaves like a prion that is the hallmark of the disease, beta amyloid. And unlike Parkinson's disease, it's, it's registered and collects diffusely across the brain. And so we can do imaging using nuclear medical scans to tell you if you're having trouble with your memory and you do this scan, you've got an almost, nothing's exactly perfect, almost 100% sensitivity and specificity to tell you whether that's because you've got Alzheimer's dementia. The one at the top just shows a little bit of light up. They've just got the normal physiological al amyloid burden, you see it in the subcortex, and the one below probably has a centelloid scan up at 80, their brain is accumulated in pathological amounts, like a prion, a chain reaction. Again, is this amyloid protein the cause? We can detect it earlier than you actually get cognitive impairment. If you screen normal people and they've got a lot of amyloid in their brain, you can tell them if you live another whatever, 10 years, 15 years, you will end up with cognitive impairment related to Alzheimer's. That's a really new experience for the human mind to learn that it's going to lose cognition based on a scan. But is the amyloid protein the cause? Again, do we just have to take the amyloid out? Will that stop it? Well, we know it can be the cause. This cute little boy here has Down syndrome. He's got an extra chromosome 21. And the amyloid protein is on that chromosome. And by virtue of that, he produces at least 50% more amyloid than uh, uh, than those who don't have trisomy 21. And if he lives beyond the age of 40, he has an almost guaranteed 100% chance of developing Alzheimer's dementia. So that, as far as I'm concerned, tells you that amyloid can cause Alzheimer's. Whether it causes it in the general population, not sure. But you may have been aware that in the last week, there's been a lot of uh, groundswell about this new monoclonal called Denonimab. There's another one called Lacunamab, very similar. It's an uh, artificially produced antibody that you inject into somebody and it goes looking for that amyloid. It latches onto it and waves to your white blood cells and tells you to come over and get rid of it. And we know by doing serial scans of their brains that you can take someone's brain that lights up like that and you can make it look like the top one again. We know that, we can get rid of the amyloid. The question was whether or not that had any impact on outcome. And the phase two and phase three trials, yeah, they, it probably does. Somewhere between 30 to 50% slowing in overall progression of disease. And we say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean function, memory, connectivity in the community, performance, those sorts of things. Difficult things to measure, I would say. But this is the last point I want to make. Is it safe? 
We think that in order to get this drug to work well, it's got to activate a pretty aggressive immune response in your brain. So to a certain extent, you're relying on inflammation. And this can be some of the bad outcomes of inflammation. This is called ARIA, which is antibody or immunotherapy-induced um, inflammation syndrome. And it can cause swelling and it can cause hemorrhages. And probably in order for it to work, you do need a bit of this. And that has two problems. One, we don't know how dangerous this is long term. And can it be easily managed? Maybe. And two, all of the outcomes in these trials relied on people and, and their carers to give feedback about how they're going. And if they were on the drug, even if they didn't know it, they found out when they had scans that showed that. And so it could have had an effect on the placebo. So all of these things need to be kept in mind. But in either, in either case, there seems to be a commonality between all of these diseases, this individual protein mapping to a particular disease, and the question remains the same. Can we use this protein for diagnosis? And if we get rid of it, can we stop the disease? And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Dr. Barber. Um, now I'd also like to welcome another familiar face to us, uh, Dr. Melissa Tang, who is a movement disorders neurologist working at the Alfred. Her PhD was in well-being, exploring the quality of life outcomes in people with extremity sarcoma. Today, she will discuss well-being and brain health. Please welcome Dr. Melissa Tang. So whilst Tissa, whilst Tissa is trying to sort out my technological issues, so thank you. It's all about teamwork, isn't it? Um, I just wanted to thank Tissa for creating this really important... that I was given today was to talk for five to seven minutes on well-being and brain health, which I'll try my best. Thank you. So I thought to myself when I was trying to prepare for this talk, it's a no-brainer, right? Like, we all need to make well-being a priority. It's important for brain health. And I thought, oh, no worries, to sell, do that. I'll create a talk. Because we all, oh, the font's a bit skew with, but that's okay. It's all about uh, keeping calm in situations, part of well-being, isn't it? And I thought, you know, to shape the talk, we have to come up with a hypothesis, shape a clinical question, and the hypothesis is that well-being has a positive outcome on brain health. I mean, we're all here because in some part, we, we all advocate, we all subscribe to that theory that well-being is important. We want to have optimum brain health. And then I went one step further and thought, but what the heck is well-being? You know, I could have done the good old look up chat GPT to tell me, but instead I polled my friends and family to figure out what well-being is and I'll share a bit of their responses with you. And then I thought, okay, brain health, I assumed it would be covered and it was covered very well by Tissa's talk, but why does it matter? And so hopefully I'll uh, summarise the literature that's out there to, to explain to you and hopefully um, explain why I think well-being is important. So I asked this question of my friends and family, what does well-being mean to you? So my DBS nurse, she said, I wake up in the morning, I set an intention for the rest of my day. 
And this is because well-being to me means being kind to myself and to others. And I need to invoke this, especially when there's a very, very challenging encounter, which is, as a DBS nurse, this is my 30-year-old DBS nurse, she, she's so wise and she, she does have a lot of challenging encounters through uh, the different facets of her work. The second quote is from one of my patients. I inject a neck for a condition called cervical dystonia and I asked her, hey, what do you think well-being means to you? And she said, it's seeing you, Mel, so that you can get rid of the pain in my neck, being free from suffering. And then she whipped out her phone and, took, and, and showed me a picture of her doing Pilates and standing on her head almost. Um, because to her, well-being was the absence of suffering and being able to do exercise. And we've all heard about how important exercise is from David's talk. This is one of my friends. Uh, he's a very, very busy, successful music composer. And he said, to me, it's the ability to have a pause in my day. You can call it meditation. But that's so that I can navigate my very busy schedule which is very important to him. It gives him purpose in his life. And he said, oh, you know, it's also by hanging out with you and Sean, my partner. But that sense of connectivity, that social connectedness, very important uh, in his definition of well-being. The last quote is from my dad, Chinese man. And he said, Mel, well-being to me. I eat well, I sleep well so that I can train the next morning. My, my father's an athlete and he, he was a national sprinter. He's one of those very disciplined, you know, no apathy there. But to him, sleep was very important and, he fo and, and a very high priority in this man. This is the um, uh, First Nations uh, Psychology Association's concept of well-being put in a picture form. And it's quite beautiful and it puts the self in the center as you can see. It focuses on community and connectedness, a sense of purpose, and it enhances body, mind, and spirit as well. But then the question becomes, how does one actually foster well-being? And this, I'm not a guru, I'm just a simple neurologist. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, it starts with a mindset like my 30-year-old nurse, you know, have an intention, choose kindness, she says. We talk about diets, and I can talk at length about this, and there are very, various different diets, both in terms of Parkinson's disease and overall brain health. So the Mediterranean diet, for example, increasing olive oils, reducing our bad fats. Uh, the Okinawan diet, where you eat to satiety as opposed to eating to fullness. You've got the dietary approaches against systolic hypertension, restricting sodium intake to less than 1,500 milligrams a day, all associated with reduced risk of hypertension, reduced risk of stroke, reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease, and improved cognitive outcomes as well. Also important to prevent all those neurodegenerative conditions we've all heard from Dan. A lot of my patients ask me, but, but what, which one should I choose? And uh, this is what I tell the people that I see, and I don't know about you, you know, do something that you can achieve, that makes sense to you. Use common sense. You know, yeah, you can follow the blueberries and the, and, you know, uh, the magic black coffee without milk and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's a, a diet that's free of processed food or limiting processed foods and limiting... Um, bad fats, increasing our plant-based portion of our meals. Exercise and movement, we've heard so much from David, so inspiring. And again, is there one exercise that fits for Parkinson's disease? There's a wealth of research out there on Parkinson's disease looking at things like cycling with the aid of videos, um, Comparing that against Tai Chi, and it does show short-term functional connectivity enhancement and functional um, MRI scans, so on and so forth. But the 
par the person with Parkinson's disease or any other human being, you know, we all have different personality types. We, will all, we all have our battles that we have to face, access to things, balance problems, so on and so forth. Choose an exercise or a movement strategy that works for you. Make it part of your day to day. And yeah, try and get in tune with the guidelines of three days a week of moderate intensity exercise, including strength and core training as well, if we can. But be kind to yourself if you can't also. Get back onto the elephant if you miss a day or two. And why? Because rest and sleep are so important. You know, ask a new, new parent whose infant wakes up hourly or who has other conditions like Parkinson's disease where their body clock goes skew whiff. Um, rest and sleep, so important. I spent the majority of my clinic day talking about sleep because Parkinson's disease affects sleep. And we all, we all struggle with sleep, I think, to a certain degree due to the vicissitudes of life in our nine to five schedule. And if possible, try and enhance a sense of social connectedness and a sense of purpose. Um, so we can talk at length about habit formation and there's good data to show that any of these approaches needs to be tailored to the individual, the different personality types and the ability to acquire or um, have to, to adopt and break bad habits is dependent on the individual. And that's a big topic in itself. Happy to have a chat later or to answer any questions about that. The um, World uh, Federation of Neurology's Brain Health Day's actual remit this year is talks about leaving no one behind. And that's picking up on the people that are vulnerable to try to make sure that we advocate for them and try and improve access to all of these well-being measures to them. Uh, and I think that that's the big take-home message from Tissa's talk. You know, that's the challenge that's posed to us. The other challenge, of course, is my technological ineptitude. Moving on to brain health and specifically asking the question of, does it matter? So the take home message from reading and trawling through the literature in the last couple of days is that there is definitely a positive correlation between well-being and brain health. And that's undeniable. That's shown through cognitive outcomes. Um, where uh, previous studies have shown that there People who report better well-being also report better episodic memory and executive function. This is a self-report study, lots of you know, potential pitfalls and vastness to this study. But then there was another study that looked at about 20,000 people across 14 countries and they followed them over nine years. And what they found is that people who engaged in lifestyle choices uh, that enhanced well-being, so people who made well-being a priority, were assessed through sequential longitudinal cognitive studies. And what they concluded was it was associated with a 20% risk reduction in dementia, including conditions like Alzheimer's disease, for example, and other dementia subtypes. And this was independent of socioeconomic variables. It's a naturalistic cohort longitudinal study. And so that, I think, provides a lot of important information. We talked a bit about lobbying and the uh, provision of funding and programs to vulnerable populations. And I think this is particularly important because we do know that vulnerable populations exist. But the important thing is that there are strategies in place, there are behaviours that you can learn that can actually um, even the playing field. And how do we do this? We do this through focusing on risk reduction, well-being measures, focusing on exercise, diet, sleep, and fostering social connectedness, which is different, by the way, to loneliness. You can be lonely even though if you have people around you. And so the question is how we can empower people with that. This is my last slide. So hopefully we get a take-home message from my talk today